you know, like I said, he didn't have a pompadour, he didn't have that look, so that's quite inviting for people to go, well, hey, I can still play the stuff, I don't have to have a, you know, and I mean, look, the last five to ten years, my hair kind of went wavy, so it was hard to make quiffs and stuff, and when I say wavy, I mean wavy goodbye. <laughs> YouTubers, something different today. You would have recently heard about the sad passing of Jeff Beck. I don't often jump on these things, but Jeff Beck really did hold a special place for me. I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about that, but I also think Jeff Beck held a really important place for the rockabilly community and for the continuation of rockabilly and for the preservation of rockabilly history. Many of you know Jeff Beck was a rock and roll pioneer, but I'm sure a lot of you are aware, because of some great videos going around, that Jeff Beck was also a dedicatee of the guitar in general, uh, and he really loved old rock and roll and old rockabilly, and pays a lot of homage to it and a lot of respect to it uh, in his playing. That's one of the reasons I love Jeff Beck. Also, I love Jeff Beck because he brought a unique voice, he played his own way, and he wasn't too concerned with what other people said was right or wrong in terms of the way you play a guitar. He kind of just carved his own path. And that's something that I always come back to when I'm figuring out my own way of playing jazz or rockabilly or whatever it is. So in today's video, I'm going to talk about some specific content that I think piqued people's interest in rockabilly over the past decade, probably a little more than a decade now. I'll show you a couple of the licks that I saw him play that got me really excited about certain things, and I'll share some short stories of my experiences with other people uh, in honour of Jeff Beck. So my story begins with the father of one of my students requesting that his son learn how to play Scatterbrain. Now that was a massive undertaking, the kid was 14 and yes he could play, but it stretched the ability of him, self, and it actually stretched my ability as well, it wasn't an easy song, it was Scatterbrain. Uh, I would have no clue how to play it now. It was about 10 years ago that I worked through it. Uh, but it was a wonderful challenge and it got me interested in Jeff Beck. And of course, after becoming interested in Jeff Beck, I start looking at YouTube videos of Jeff Beck and it's not long before YouTube either shares what's sort of going on at the time with him, which was the rock and roll party uh, in uh, commemoration of Les Paul. And also, uh, you know, YouTube figuring out that I happen to like rockabilly, so it was sharing these clips of him playing these old guitars. And this was one of the coolest clips I've ever seen on YouTube, and it's still one of the coolest clips. I'll put the link below. It's this clip where he's picking up different guitars and talking about why he loves them. And he starts by picking up a Telecaster, shows that it has humbuckers and admits that he sad sadly let go of his Esquire. But it's not too long before he picks up a Gretsch Rancher, and he actually talks about how he loves it because it didn't have a round F-hole, it had a triangular F-hole. But then he begins talking about the Blue Caps and Gene Vincent, and this is so cool. So he starts playing some stuff on that guitar, he kind of goes into that. Sort of starts playing that stuff, and it's not long before he says, well, actually, they weren't really playing that. It was more that strummy kind of stuff which was going on. And he talks about it being, uh, you know, featured in the Blue Caps, and I think it was in a movie as well, in the cover of a movie, or something to do with a movie. I'm missing some of these details here. This is all just coming from my memories and experiences. Then he picks up a duo jet, and this is thing where things really take a turn. Uh, let me grab my duo jet, actually. So he starts talking about Cliff Gallup, and if his enthusiasm is not infectious, then you must be immune to all kinds of enthusiasm, because it's so cool when he starts talking about those licks and that sound, and as you may have seen me play a little bit in the intro, he does this, he does a race with the devil though. <laughs> talks about that bell-like sound that you got from a duo jet. Now, if you're looking at a duo jet and you watch that video, you will have to have one. I had one at the time, fortunately. I was living at home and saving all my hard-earned teaching money up and pretty much just buying guitars, which I'm not actually, I don't regret to be honest, because if you ever need to sell a guitar down the track, you get some money back. It's better than 
drinking that money, which a lot of my friends were doing and whatnot. So don't regret it. Uh, now, it's not like I wasn't already into rockabilly. I'd been really into all kinds of stuff. So I'd obviously studied a lot of Brian Setzer. And I, at the time, I actually worked a little bit on some Hank Gull and stuff, a little bit of Grady Martin stuff. Um, but, you know, the typical Eddie Cochran, Dwayne Eddie, the stuff that you kind of hear surrounding the sets of trap a little bit more. I'm going to call it the sets of trap. But hearing all this Sun record stuff and, and hearing Gene Vincent and Cliff Gallup coming up again and again made me realize, you know, I thought I was an originator. I wanted to be an originator. I didn't really want to go back too far and spend too much time on that stuff. But it made me realize by doing that, it just informs you so much more and you become such a more informed and interesting player. And of course, you build on that information. So it was a really great lesson. At the time, I was also in the process of being scouted for the Sun Rising show that I'm playing in now, that I've been playing in for over 10 years. And watching, I thought, hey, if Jeff, Jeff Beck can play tribute stuff, why can't I? It was, I'm having a great time watching him do it and it's really cool. Uh, and it kind of inspired me to say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give this a go. And I've been doing that for 10 years and I still love doing it, it's great fun. So really important seeing him play that stuff. So of course the next thing that kind of happened in that video is he, he picks up a 175. He says it's an L5. I'm pretty sure it's a 175. I could be wrong, um, but it's a beautiful blonde Gibson. I'm going to pick up my 175 and let's just play a few little things there. So he starts talking about this 175 that he used to rent and he'd been renting it for so long, the shop owner said, Jeff, just keep it, which is really cool. And he starts talking about how that guitar was the Scotty Moore sound. So he starts playing this Scotty Moore stuff. The guitar's not even plugged in and it still sounds fantastic. He does this lick. just sounds like early Scotty Moore. He's even just sort of wild with the thumb. He just he just gets it. He gets into the vibe of whatever it is that he's playing and he, he digs in and he regurgitates it with so much passion and panache. I don't know what panache means. I think it means like, you know, excitement and whatnot. He's a guy who, he, he doesn't look rockabilly, okay? He doesn't have the rockabilly accoutrements. He doesn't have a pair of fluffy dice hanging off his face. Or something and he's playing all this rockabilly stuff and it sounds awesome and he just he seems even cooler to me because he doesn't care he's not trying to be like a rockabilly guy he just loves the music and he's playing it and I think that's really inspiring for anyone watching that video that might be on the outskirts of that genre and that's a great thing there's nothing wrong with being really passionate and just loving the culture and the vibe but I felt that was really important so it was about this point in time especially when rock and roll party came out I was starting to get phone calls from people saying Hey, um, I see you, you're like sort of known as a bit of a rockabilly guy and you teach guitar. Are you able to teach some of the stuff that Jeff Beck's doing? I had a handful of guys come through that I helped teach a little bit of Scotty Moore. You know, we looked at some Cliff Gallup stuff, even some of the Barney Kessel stuff. The... Like, this is not exactly how to play it, but it was something like... long time since I've transcribed that, that's definitely not correct, but you would know exactly what I'm talking about if you've watched the Rock and Roll Party uh, DVD. Another reason why Jeff Beck was important to me, you know, that, that sound playing jazz on a 175 is one of the greatest tones I've ever heard from anybody, and that was Jeff Beck. So you can see why I feel like this particular period, this content that was put out with Jeff Beck involved was just so important to, you know, even, even now, currently what's going on. It, it definitely just helped continue row that rockabilly boat. I wonder if rockabilly boats are a thing. Oh, and also, you know, like I said, he didn't have a pompadour, he didn't have that look, so that's quite inviting for people to go, well, hey, I can still play the stuff. I don't have to have a, you know, and I mean, look, the last five to 10 years, my hair kind of went wavy. So it was hard to make quiffs and stuff. And when I say wavy, I mean wavy goodbye. Also, if you're familiar with my solo jazz channel, and this channel, you can see how these particular things I'm talking about obviously had an impact. Like, we're going back 10 years now, and I, we don't really know the way things affect us, but hey, I'm talking about it now, and I absolutely love those clips, so it definitely had a big impact. And by the way, if you've seen the scene in Rock and Roll Party where Jeff Beck and Brian Setzer are jamming, there's a lot of talk about Brian Setzer kicking Jeff Beck's butt, and, you know, outplaying him, or 
the Gretsch really shows its legs in this part. Now, I'm a Gretsch guy. You guys know I love Gretsches. The Les Paul sounded fantastic. They were different sounds. My whole thing in, what, in seeing that is that Jeff Beck was paying homage to a variety of players, and Brian Setzer was doing his thing, kind of setting the standard of the modern sound that he has you know, uh, spearheaded. So that, to me, was an amazing moment. Not, oh, Brian Setzer's kicking Jeff Beck's butt. No way. It was a completely different thing. Comment below if you disagree and what you think of it. I'd love to know what you think. Now, one other really big thing about Jeff Beck you may or may not know is he used his thumb and his finger, and it made such an impact on his tone. That really fat sound he got, it's just the way that he played. In fact, I've heard so many stories and complaints about Jeff Beck strats not sounding anything like Jeff Beck. The irony is, is that if Jeff Beck walked into a guitar shop and picked up anything, it would sound more like a Jeff Beck signature guitar than any Jeff Beck signature guitar would sound like if someone else played it. I hope that makes sense. That was quite a mouthful, but think about it, okay? So that really inspired me to go, well, you know, when I'm playing jazz or when I'm playing rockabilly, I, I want to find my own things, even if it's not using no pick, that was a double negative, but I think it still made sense. Whatever it might be, find your own way. But he did his research, he did, he paid his dues, he knew what he was playing, and then he would do his own way, he would produce his own tones, he would do it with his own sound, and somehow still get really close to the authenticity of the original stuff as well. So, it just blows my mind, he was such a great player. Okay, so we're pretty much, I'm pretty much wrapping up now, and I'll say one thing, even if you are a rockabilly guy, the flip side of this is that you should check out some of his great work. Emotion and Commotion is an amazing album. Transcends genre. It's just a great piece of work. So the flip side of this is, obviously I'm talking about how he brought uh, a mainstream audience to Rockabilly. If you're a Rockabilly guy and, and you're appreciating all that stuff, go away and check out Emotion and Commotion in particular. It's fantastic. I mean, the whole, everything he did was great. Um, but I think... That's one of those albums that's just beautiful. And he gave some players a really good up, like Daryl Hyam, uh, Tal Wilkenf Wilkenfell. Apologize, I should have looked that up before. Actually, that's, I'm digging the memory banks from there. But you know, so the bass player that played with him, that the the lady that played bass with him, she's amazing. So again, just more gifts that keep on giving that Jeff Beck, you know, helped along the way, and I think did some great things for. So. Rest in peace, Jeff Beck. Thank you for the inspiration and the education. And speaking of which, I didn't really want to make this video too much of a promotion for my channel. Um, but I do want to say if you enjoyed the licks and you enjoy the rockabilly stuff, uh, if you jump on my Patreon, you get all the transcriptions for my videos as I put them out. However, if you want the full library, check out Adrian White online. Keep playing, keep enjoying and go listen to Emotion and Commotion. And if you haven't seen it, check out Jeff Beck's Rock and Roll Party with Daryl Heim, Imelda May, and that awesome band, and all those guys. I think the Big Town Playboys. Have a good one. I will see you guys in the next video.